morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Left Forum. This panel is uh, sponsored by the Union for Radical Political Economics, URP. Uh, you can find all about it at urp.org, urp.org. And also by, uh, it's co-sponsored, uh, URP and Science and Society, the journal, uh, Science and Society, scienceandsociety.com, not .org, but .com. Okay, so uh, the presenters today are David Leibman, who is running a little bit late. He'll be here in a few minutes. And we also have uh, David Brennan um, from Franklin and Marshall. And we have uh, Matias Bernengo from Bucknell University, uh, who is also a URP, uh, well, have you all of you URP members? If we I'm should up be. today, if I'm up today. Okay. So we, we have somebody that we should send a letter. Yeah, we're we'll sending you a letter, right. just to remind you. Reminded you of paying your dues. Exactly. So uh, uh, the, the panel is on uh, the prospects of global capitalism, and there is, uh, it's, I don't think there is a big uh, a spectacular in the media uh, debate between Marxists and post Keynesians. I think for the most part, the, the uh, critical alternative discourse in the media is post Keynesian. Um, or it's Keynesian, not so much post Keynesian, because post Keynesian, post -Keynesian is more radical. Um, um, but, but there is also an undercurrent of debate between Marxists and, and post Keynesians, uh, which is on, on the extreme left of the spectrum. I don't think that, it's, uh, that we would easily find a serious uh, economist um, in modern times uh, who is on the left who has in one way or the other been influenced by both Marx and Keynes, right? So it's, it's not a matter whether, you know, this, uh, these influences are present, but the extent to which they are and how, uh, you know, uh, these influences are articulated in the worldview of a particular individual uh, economist or thinker or critic. So um, uh, let me start with, uh, with Matthias. Um, who I suppose is going to present his mixture of Marxism and Keynesianism, like e every one of us, uh, perhaps. Okay, well, thank you for organizing this, for having me here, and for you guys uh, you know, to uh, spend part of your Saturday here. Uh, I, I suppose I have, what, 15 minutes or so? Um, we we'll have 15 minutes here. Yeah, that, that seems like a good... Okay, so... Um, so first let me clarify, uh, I have a, you know, a blog that it's called Naked Keynesianism, which sort of uh, suggests that uh, when Julio told me, I, I assumed that was the, you know, I've, I've been typecasted as the post Keynesian in the, in the panel. And although, you know, <coughs> at least David Leibman, you know, uh, which I know better, uh, he was a student of Ed Nell, and he's close to the sort of views on Keynes that I would have, so it's, uh, uh, so I don't want to spend too much time on that. I, I just want to briefly say, so I'm sort of a Srafian, which is, uh, Srafa is a, you know, undeservedly unknown uh, economist of the 20th century. Was very close to Keynes, uh, wrote uh, very little, uh, few papers, very influential papers in the 20s and early 30s, and then a monograph uh, that took 28 years for him to publish uh, and came up in 1960, which basically brings back all the elements of Marx into uh, modern uh, you know, uh, theoretical framework. Uh, and actually, by the same token, shows the limitations of neoclassical economics. Uh, so it's a, a double sort of uh, you know, uh, intellectual work at the same time that it brings back the, not just Marx, but you know, the works of the classical authors. At the same time, it shows that, uh, that neoclassical economics has serious logical flaws. And as I said, he was close to, to Keynes. He never actually discussed, uh, you know, in, in his very short uh, publications, uh, issues related to what we traditionally think of Keynesian economics. But uh, his main disciple, uh, a guy that passed away last year, I think, or the previous year, Pierangelo Garagnani, an Italian economist too, uh, he was the guy that sort of developed his ideas into what we would sort of think of Keynesian framework. The idea. Uh, that essentially, if you put those two things together, is you know, it's the idea that what drives the process of accumulation is the demand side, okay? And so you're uh, prone to have what Marx would have called crisis of realization. So effective demand crisis. And financial crisis being prominent in that. 
And Marx being probably the first to analyze that with some seriousness in, in economics. And at the same time that you have that demand aspect to the theory, what Rafa does is he brings back the notion, for me, the essential story. You know, it's a discussion of the theory of value, but the essential story of bringing back the classical theory of value is the idea that distribution is conflictive. It's not you get according to your productivities, marginal this, marginal that, but it's that it's class conflict. So it puts class conflict again at the center of the theoretical stage. So I think it's perfectly compatible in some sense to be Keynesian and, and Marxist. And so a Srafian post-Keynesian would be, you know, certainly building on, uh, on the works of Marx and, and, and other classical authors. Uh, so, so that to clarify to some extent, uh, I, I would suggest the, the theoretical sort of point of view from where I'm coming from. I should say, there, you know, to some extent, this is you know, it's a conference of activism and what the left is going to do when what are we doing facing this global crisis. So I suppose that, although not quite correctly, but I think that there is this notion that uh, we're talking about uh, reform versus revolution or something along those lines, and and that the differences could be more marked and. and and, and then obviously, you know, there are differences of what we think of Keynesian as being social democracy or socialism or sort of reformist sort of strand of the left, whereas, you know, Marxism might be, you know, although it's not clear that it should necessarily be uh, connected to the more revolutionary sort of strand of the... And so in that respect, I would sort of be more willing to accept the divide as, you know, being sort of some difference that it's relevant within the left. Uh, on those things. I'll, I'll have to say something you know, later on, on that second issue, which I think is important. So, uh, what I want to say about uh, these different prospects of, uh, you know, of Marxism and post Keynesianism uh, with respect to the crisis uh, would be heavily biased towards issues of Latin America, which is where my research actually sort of lies and where I can say something intelligent and relevant about it. Um, hopefully, maybe not. Not so, yeah. Been overestimating my abilities. So uh, the the crisis, you know, in, in Latin America uh, hit an you know, uh, you know an economy that was growing uh, at an incredibly fast pace uh, for the first time in, in a long time. So Latin America, since the debt crisis of the 80s, uh, basically uh, slowed down uh, to at some point nil growth, even negative by the 80s, the last decade, uh, slow recovery in the 90s. Uh, but still very low in comparison to you know the sort of golden age of capitalism of the 50s and 60s, nothing comparable. So for the region as a whole, so that you have an idea, it's the per capita GDP growth probably was around 4% for the whole region or something like that at around uh, the 50s and 60s. So there was catching up. We were you know, sort of still poor, but catching up with the developed world. And, and by the 80s and, and 90s, it's close to zero. Uh, so, and then the 90s perhaps goes slightly higher than that. Uh, if you average the two, it's close to zero. It's probably in the 90s is one, you know, percent, one and a half, if, if that much. It will vary also from country to country considerably. And then you have that we pick up uh, in the in the 2000s, particularly after 2002. So, 2003 to 2008 is a period of impressive growth. Okay, uh, significant rates of growth, more or less uh, the same levels of the golden age. In some cases, higher. In some cases, for example, in Argentina, there are the highest uh, rates of growth recorded in economic history. So uh, that's how high the levels of growth were. So f before we even say what the crisis did, let me say a couple of things. So there is a particular notion that it's out in the press. Uh, uh, and Argentina is prominent on that. I should say, I'm, I'm from Argentina, but I, I grew up in Brazil. Uh, and so in, in the case of Argentina, the notion is that this growth was uh, first only possible because you had a big crisis before, and that's sort of accepted, you know, uh, as something of a general thing. Uh, I should say, Me Mexico is not seen as because uh, Mexico is not growing, so Mexico didn't have the boom of the 2000s. So, uh, and so there are significant differences. I, I also, I should say, I, I'm talking more about South America when, when I think about it, rather than Latin America, which is sort of a not very good sort of definition. They're very different things now. South America exports commodities. Mexico and, and Central America are fundamentally exporting people. Uh, so it's maquilas, which is an indirect way of exporting people. So you have very cheap labor that you're basically you know, utilizing down there. 
and you are directly shedding people, and remittances are really high. So Mexico is too big for remittances to be the biggest thing, but you know, in countries like El Salvador, uh, they have you know, 7 million people, and 1 million people are outside of the country, or, or so, don't quote me on those numbers. Uh, remittances are 20% of GDP. Uh, so, uh, and that's basically the, they have it more fun than us. <laughs> uh, so they have a, a deficit in the current account of more or less 20% of GDP. So basically what they're doing, the model of development is, we send 1 million people to the US, they send us money back, and that's how we can survive. And import the needs that we need to, you know, uh, make life bearable in El Salvador. So it's it's a terrible model of development. So that's very and there's not much growth, so to speak, in, in that area compared to South America. South America, uh, there was a commodity boom. So one was, you grew because you had a terrible crisis before and everybody that has a terrible crisis, so if you're at the bottom, you know, grow a little bit, it's easy. Second of all, it's all China. So the notion is that China did the whole thing. So. Uh, China is growing brutally. The demand for Chinese, uh, you know, uh, the, the Chinese demand for commodities is so huge that it brought the prices of commodities up, and that's how you have all of this growth. And supposedly, the risk associated to the crisis is that the prices of commodities will collapse. They collapse, you know, somewhat, and then recovered, I should say, at this point. And and that that's the end of this sort of you know model of development, and that's sort of the notion. So first, also let me put some lens on that. It's not absolutely true that all countries have grown at the same pace in South America and that China explains everything. So first of all, for example, China does import huge amounts of certain things. Uh, so, so we have one more. Uh, <clears throat> so now you start and you follow what I was saying. So I need to catch my breath. So, China, China imports something like 50, something crazy, 50% of iron ore, and so uh, it really pushes up the price of iron ore. Uh, it's also importing huge amounts of copper, and that pushes, you know. So if you're exporting those goods, uh, say Brazil, iron ore, uh, Chile, copper, uh, the boom is to a significant extent explained by uh, the Chinese demand. So the Chinese demand is pushing the prices up, and that has created space for a certain host of policies in those countries, uh, which may not have been pursued, but you know, because they have governments on the left in Latin South America for the most part, uh, uh, those social redistribution policies you know, were in place, and, and you have a significant improvement in income distribution uh, in most of South America, and you have significant rates of growth. But in other countries, you know, uh, depending on what uh, you're looking at, you know, Chinese demand for uh, oil is not that big. It's nine percent. So the price of oil was not pushed by by China. Uh, soybeans it has an impact, but less than you would think. It's not as large as uh, you'd think. Uh, and for other things, it's uh, you know irrelevant. Uh, coffee, sugar, several of the commodities that Latin American countries produce, it's not there. So of the countries actually, for example, to compare two countries that have very different growth rates, Brazil and Argentina. Uh, on average, Argentina grew during the boom period, 2003-2008, at about 7.5%, 7 whereas Brazil grew at about 4%, uh, so not quite half, but almost half. And Brazil was a big, it's a big producer of iron ore, and of the commodities. I mean, Brazil produces other things, obviously. And iron ore and, and soy. And that pushed the prices up way more than the prices of what Argentina produced, which is essentially soybeans and for exports to China. And Argentina grew way more. So, uh, so the notion that the whole growth was based on Chinese growth, it's exaggerated. Okay? So that's part of what we have to bear, into, you know, bear in mind. So a good chunk of the growth is associated, I, I would suggest, to the redistributive policies that were in place. So it's the fact that you have an extension of social programs. Uh, so all of these countries experimented with uh, transfers. Mind you, that's something that the left has done. So the left has accepted something that uh, 30 years ago would have been anathema. The idea that targeted spending is the way to go. So universal benefits are gone. So now we transfer money to the poor. So if you prove that your kid needs to go to school, we'll give you some sort of help, uh, also familia uh, in Brazil, so it pays, you know, according. so it's means tested. So that's something that the World Bank used to defend and certainly wasn't, you know, a program of the left uh, 30 years ago, but we accept it. But mind you, it does have impacts, you know, even if I would rather have it as, you know, universal, you know, social programs, the targeted programs ha have had uh, some impact. Mind you, again, 
they're not that huge, okay? So people tend to think that these are huge. So in Brazil, for example, the spending on, on the whole Bolsa Familia is probably uh, of the order of 3% uh, of government spending. So it's not a, you know, uh, it's not the largest even uh, program, uh, gov governmental, uh, you know, social transfer program. Uh, and that's, uh, that's the same sort of uh, for almost any country in the region, okay? So, uh, so having said that, uh, so that th that's the you know the situation that we are when we uh, are hit by the crisis. Uh, what does the crisis do, and what are the possibilities open by this crisis? And if I have any time, I'll say something of what would be differences between post-Keynesian and Marxist sort of uh, views on that. But so, first of all, I think that the the crisis uh, uh, has not yet. Uh, been as dire as people tend to think. So we actually, most countries in South America got out of the crisis pretty fast. So by 2009 they gave, you know, significant hit and they slowed down and by 2010 most countries uh, start growing relatively fast. It goes hand in hand with, as I told you, the prices of commodities collapsed in 2009, sorry, and they, you know, recovered in, in 2010 and they sort of plateaued but they haven't collapsed. And so, first of all, there is some space, it seems, to continue a uh, continuum of the sort of social programs and spending that uh, allowed this improvement in inequality, which is rare, by the way, because in the rest of the world, as you all have been reading Piketty, you know, and all of this stuff, you know, we all now are against inequality, and, you know, even right-wingers decided that uh, inequality is a problem. And so, uh, in Latin America, I should say, it, it, it did improve, okay? Uh, so national resource socialism, or whatever you want to call it, actually seems to work. We have a reduced inequality. Mind you again, bringing it back to levels of inequality of the 70s, so it's, which is, for Latin America, it's still pretty high. So we have lots of inequality, so we're fine, don't worry. And so, um, but it's not dire, because the price of commodities didn't completely collapse. And so I, I'm gonna be, strangely enough, because I'm often not uh, optimistic, I think that, Here's there is space for continuous growth, because particularly it's not obvious for those commodities in which China is relevant that China will stop growing completely. So China will slow down, already slowed down, but China will move uh, some crazy number of people from rural areas to urban areas. Some, you know, I've, I've heard all sorts of numbers from, you know, something like 300 million people, and they, you know, if you're going to build you know, cities, you know, for 300 million people, you're going to build schools, hospitals, you're going to still demand iron ore and copper and all of those things, so um, there are other issues involved in that, environmental issues and whatnot, but uh, those are green issues, not the red and, and you know, pinkish issues that we're supposed to discuss today. So uh, that's one thing. The other thing is that uh, the crisis in the north, in the central countries, has generated some sort of a peculiar uh, situation that is not often common for Latin American countries. And that lack of growth in the U.S. and a slow recovery and a labor market that sucks, uh, pardon my French, and you know, a crisis in Europe that it's never ending, uh, has created conditions for relatively low levels of rate of interest in the advanced world. And that actually is good for Latin America. Uh, it does provide uh, excess liquidity and people you know, allowing to put money into these countries without the risk of capital flight which has traditionally been a significant problem for Latin America. Uh, and mind you, the worst is the elites taking the money out. Uh, so there is less space because, you know, U.S. Treasury bonds don't pay that much. And so they might as well put uh, the money to work uh, on some, you know, uh, mineral project uh, down in Latin America itself. So uh, the crisis has not been as dire in that sense. and. And there is significant space for the same left of center parties that are for the most part in place in Latin America. So in South America, I should say, or in several of the countries in South America. So in Chile, they have a, a short experiment with a conservative government and they re-elected Bachelet. And so, uh, and I have one minute, so let me say something about the Marx uh, post keynesian stuff. So from the point of view of, not the theoretical stuff I said at the beginning, the more the sort of a reformist versus revolution and whatnot. So the left of central governments in Latin America have been, as I sort of hinted, very, you know, even for a posty, you know, I'm the sort of reformist, sort of uh, mild manner, so guy here. Uh, they have been quite uh, tame. Uh, it's uh, targeted social policies, uh, social spending that it's uh, not the biggest in the agenda. I, I 
wrote a little book on Brazil. If you read Portuguese, please buy it. If you don't read it, buy it too. You know, it just helps me. Uh, so if you look at what Brazil spends, the, the spending on, on, on the, so, the Bolsa Familia, you know, this huge program that gets f some 40 something million people, you know, uh, it's uh, basically something like, as I told you, 3% of government spending. Whereas payments and interest on the uh, public debt, it's more than double that. It's probably, you know, it's, uh, now it's not three times that, but on average has been something of that order. So how many people get the interest on the debt Brazilian months? It's around 20,000 families. So whereas Bolsa Familia goes to something like 12 million families, uh, the, you know, the interest rates go to 20,000 families. Uh, so the biggest, by far, the biggest program of uh, a left of center government, which is very good and has led to significant improvement, and it's much better than the right wingers that might be you know, in place if they didn't win elections, it's still pretty much biased towards uh, you know, corporate welfare. And so uh, there is space, that's my sort of uh, contention, I think there is. I think that the space will be there for a while because of the international situation. China will still grow, the North will not develop. The left of center parties have lots of support. But don't expect much more than this. We have internalized in the South a lot of the IMF policies. So the very last one that I want to say is including the fiscal austerity. So all governments in Latin America maintain primary surpluses. When they have a primary deficit, Argentina has had for two years primary deficits. Primary deficits, you exclude the financial payments. So it's what the government really spends on their everyday issues. They have surpluses. Countries like Mexico and Brazil have had surpluses for over 20 years. So we are fiscally responsible. It's a terrible way of referring to that. We're not responsible. It's irresponsible. We're saving money to transfer to corporations, and we're not spending on the things that we need to reduce inequality, poverty, and so on and so forth, which, by the way, as I said, yeah, it's better, but it's still very little. So that's it. OK. David? Thank you. Uh, thank you. I'm, I'm uh, David Brennan of Franklin Marshall College. Um, I'm going to discuss uh, America um, in the crisis. Um, the crisis beginning in 2007 was the most recent I told you so moment from the left. Uh, perhaps Marxists more than others were quick to provide a variety of explanations for why the Great Recession happened. The idea here, though, was that the, the Great Recession was going to have lasting significance, right? There was going to be change that had to emerge, right? This was the thing that, you know, was going to bring about all this sorts of change. Well, that's a great story, except it didn't happen, right? In 2014, profits are higher than they have ever been, okay? Wages haven't changed, unemployment, right, hasn't, you know, there's been no significant changes Know, other than in the downward direction for those things. So the question is, what happened? Why did all of this change that should have occurred, why did it not happen? Okay. So um, I want to make three points or four points during this, this talk, and we'll see how many we get to. I'm just going to throw them out there, and then, then I'll uh, make my argument here. One, US capitalism was not suffering from a long-term declining trend in profitability over the last half century. This is very different than the story many Marxists tell. Um, I, my research shows that there has been uh, growing surpluses over the last 50 years, too. The effect of neoliberalism was more on changing how profits were realized um, as opposed to um, the level of profits. So we need to think about um, neoliberalism, I think, a little bit differently than we had. Uh, three, the crisis was a very short-lived event. Uh, lasting less than one year, at least from a profit perspective. Now, there's all sorts of other um, aspects of the crisis which we have not recovered from it, but at least from a profit perspective, it was a very short-lived event. And last, uh, the rebound uh, in profits was robust, and it continues today, and I would like to spend a little bit of time at the end of the talk to explain why that occurred. Um, all right. Uh, Marxian crisis theory, and I'm a Marxist, by the way, so... Um, but I, I need to be a little bit critical of what, of what has been said um, in terms of the, Marx, the Marxian crisis theory. Uh, one version is the falling rate of profit uh, explanation 
uh, by Kleinman, the idea that there was too much capital and that meant there was low profit, sluggish investment, the rise in organic composition of capital argument, and that's um, what really caused the Great Recession. Um, another series of theories are more the stagnationist theories, um, this idea that there was too much surplus and that the surplus couldn't be absorbed either by um, consumption or investment. Uh, hence, it was speculation that was primarily driving investment and, and debt that was primarily fueling consumption. And the last argument is basically neoliberalism. The idea here that there was crap class conflict between the finance class and they did all of these sorts of things, which you know gave rise to a whole series of neoliberal policies, and that's what caused the crisis in 2007. The problem with all of those theories is we've rebounded and none of those things have changed. There's been no um, reversal of neoliberal policies. There has been no change in um, the amount of capital in the sense that uh, capital hasn't been dramatically depreciated um, and monopoly capitalism hasn't gone away. So if, those, like, if that's what caused the crisis, how are we able then to recover with all of these elements still in place? So scratching my head, I'm like, how, how did this all happen? Right? Well, so what I did was I looked um, back at the work of uh, Koletsky. And um, I was a, always enjoyed reading um, uh, his approach and his theoretical perspective. And he had a view of profits which primarily focused on realization. What expenditures are important for profits to be realized? Okay, so I have here um, a quick handout, which I'll give you, which you only have to look at uh, equation one in a graph. That's all we have. So, let's pass this. So the idea here, is that profits simply, in order for them to be realized, profits either come from investment, export surplus, government budget deficit, capitalist consumption, or worker savings. Okay, that's true by definition, by the way. Okay, so if you rearrange the national income accounts, right, in the same way Koletsky did, that, that equation is true by definition. Okay, so what all I did was say, okay, how did the sources of realization change over time? Maybe that may help to tell us something. So if we look at the graph, skip everything else, just go to the graph. Back, yeah, if you flip that over, it should be a graph. So what we have there is the total profits in the United States. This is all in 2009 dollars. Um, it's quarterly data, but quarterly data, but it is annualized. Um, and again, it's in real values. So if we look we've, from 1964 to 2014, profit growth has been particularly robust. Okay? So why do other Marxists come up with data that suggests something else? This is a very broad measure of, of surplus. Okay? And this, this idea that Kolesky has was his attempt to take Marx's idea of surplus from the uh, reproduction schemes and to make sense of them in modern accounting terms, okay? So this is, it's called a Koletskian notion of profit, but it's, it's a Marxian notion of profit. It's just Koletsky's version of it. Um, okay, so let's look at, at what has, has occurred here. The primary expenditures responsible for profit realization have always been that, that line there, uh, capitalist consumption minus workers' savings, okay? And what has basically changed due to neoliberalism is not that profit growth. In fact, profit growth is slower in the neoliberal era, slightly. Um, but this percentage of profit realization, which is due to capitalist consumption and workers' savings. So why is this important to realize? Well, it's important because what we begin to see here is that we don't need Capitalism doesn't need, um, if you look at government expenditures, it doesn't need tremendous number amount of government expenditures. Okay, so we're just coming out of the crisis now, right? We're still having this talk about the budget deficit being too high. Why can we do that? Well, we can do that 
because the way that capitalism is organized today, it doesn't need government expenditures. Okay? It doesn't need massive amounts of investment. Right? Why? Because it can get its realization by shifting the distribution of income towards capitalists, which have a tendency to spend that money, right? To consume that, right? And the increase in debt. Now that's that's a pretty sad story <laughs> for the reason that we can expect surplus growth to continue. We can expect neoliberalism and all the negative things that go along with neoliberalism on a personal level to continue. Right? Capitalism will not implode all by itself. Right? 2007 showed us something, right? How a how capitalism was able to sort of work its way through all of this. Okay, so this is sort of a um, a lesson that we on the left sort of have to begin to grapple with here. That it may get a lot worse in terms of day to -day, people's day to day lives, even though profitability will continue. And you know, those sorts of things um, uh, will happen here. The, we don't, we can't wait for our capitalism to just implode. We don't need, capitalism doesn't need, I should say, massive government spending. It doesn't need a national investment policy. It doesn't need trade reform. Um, and all of that is, is fairly unfortunate <laughs> for a whole host of but anyway, that's the just the thing. Thank you. Sweet. Yeah. So David, you have uh, 15 minutes, 15 minutes for your presentation. I'll try not to use them. Uh, I, I apologize for being late. Uh, I, I thought this was in session three, and I just got informed by the miracles of modern telephonics that it's in session one. So I haven't even had any breakfast, and I don't know what I'm going to say to you today. Also, I thought this session was about Marxism and Keynesianism and Marxism, or post-Keynesianism and yes, Marxism. Right. Uh, I see post-Keynesian post thinking as in the Keynesian tradition. It's Keynesian. So I'm going to give the old term paper, you know, the undergraduate term paper, Keynes versus Marx, you know, my version of it. Uh, and uh, that's... And, uh, not so much about uh, uh, contemporary events, but more about ways of thinking to go behind the contemporary events. And I think the way I'm going to begin is with a movie review. Now, this is a movie that goes back many years. I have to set the stage for this. Um, you know that when you speak, I hear music. <laughs> I wonder why. David, since, since we broke your, your uh, we interrupted your, your speech, um, they are filming. So ah. if you don't move around too much, you will, I'll, your, I'll try. your head will be in it. I'll try not to move yes. around too much. And okay. we'll music everything. is there's music in the other session across yeah. the across the room. I, I hope it has nothing to do with Sorry. me. Uh, or maybe uh, I don't know, maybe a little music might liven things up a bit. Here's the context for this. I'll you watch the time for me and tell me tell me when I can shut up and I will. Um, I was an undergraduate transfer student at Ruskin College, Oxford, in England, in 1962-63. And sometime, I think it was in the fall of 62, this film came out. And it, uh, it's a film with Ingrid Bergman. The name of the film is The, the Visit. Has anybody heard of this? The vi I, it's, it's amazing. I've looked for it on Netflix and uh, Hulu and so forth. I can't, I can't uh, locate a modern... Uh, electronic copy of it, but I'm going to continue to work on that because I'd love to see it again. I saw it 50 years ago, a little more, more than that, and I, I have a very, very strong recollection of the film. I can give you a, a synopsis. You'll probably wonder where this is going, but you'll see. Uh, now, one of my tutors at uh, Ruskin College in Oxford was uh, the vice principal of the college, Henry Smith was a, uh, his name, uh, and he was an avid Keynesian. He was very Keynesian, uh, and Keynesianism uh, Post-Keynesianism didn't exist yet. It was just Keynesian, you know, and uh, uh, in the early 1960s, it was still very new. It was very electrical. You know, it, it had swept through the economics profession. Uh, anyway, that's, I'll come back to that. Now, this film is set in a, a, a town 
uh, a medium-sized town in a central European country. You don't really know what country, and it doesn't matter. Uh, I can't remember the name of the town. And there was a young woman born in this town by the name of Carla. Uh, she was born uh, on the wrong side of the tracks. That's an American image, not a European image, but you, you know what I mean by it. Uh, and uh, raised in a very poor family. And as a teenager, she was, well, I can't put this too delicately. This is the backstory of the film, by the way. Uh, she was knocked up she was by uh, one of the sons of one of the wealthier families, one of the respectable business families in the town, a man named Sn uh, Serge Miller. Uh, and in order to cover their respectability, they invented all sorts of false stories about her and created a, a calumnious campaign against her. And to put it in a word, she was railroaded from the town, literally barefoot and pregnant. Uh, subsequently, somewhere in Europe, she met and married the wealthiest man in Europe. This is a fantasy, of course. Uh, and he died and left her his money, so she became one of the wealthiest widows, you know, and a very powerful presence. Then, at the time the film begins, she has announced that she is returning to the town. She's going to come pay a visit. And that's the meaning of the title. Okay? Now, she comes to the town. The town is in a state of economic depression. Uh, it's in a, a genuine Keynesian funk. Uh, and here she comes, and they have a big dinner in her honor, you know, at the main hotel on the town square. And she announces that she will give a million guilders to the town for reconstruction, plus a million to be divided among the inhabitants of the town on one condition. They must take Serge Miller's life. You see? This man who abused her so many years ago has got to be killed. And at first, the mayor of the town stands up and he's indignant and he says, Madam, that is an outrageous suggestion. Nothing of the kind shall ever take place. How can you even think, you know, and, and, and the whole thing breaks up. And she retires to her suite in the hotel to wait. She has a retinue, an enormous retinue, servants and so forth. So they take two floors of the hotel and they sit. And this offer has been put out there. Then what you do is you watch this sum of money gradually corrode the social relations of the town. You watch this money penetrate, and you watch the memories rise to the surface. And you watch the old class divisions reemerge, and the old antagonisms, and people reconstruct the story. And they get a picture of the social reality, you know. And at this point, I'm, uh, I, I, everyone's going to now order the film. I hope you can find it. I'm, I'm going to stop. I'm not going to tell you how it ends. You know, but as a young 19-year-old Marxist uh, studying in Oxford, I was fascinated by this film because it represented for me the way a sum of money could act, money as the alienated essence of humanity, as Marx put it in one of the earlier writings. You know, that money would corrode social relations and would strip away everything that people held was sacred. And I got a lot of in insight. I connected it to chapter one of uh, volume one of Capital, uh, and then my reading of that, which I was starting to do, you know. I come to class the next day, and there is Henry Smith, uh, and he's lecturing on Keynes. And he says, there's this wonderful movie that's out just now. You have to all go see it. It's called The Visit, and what it shows is the multiplier. You see? And he said, you see, this town was totally depressed before, and then this woman came in and dropped an investment into the town, you know, and they had to fix everything up. Uh, in order to prepare for her visit, and when they fixed it, they created incomes out of which there was more spending, out of which there was more income, out of which there was more spending. It's a perfect example of the Keynesian multiplier process. Now that to me kind of sums up the level of social perception at which you think when you think of things in a Keynesian way and when you think of things in a Marxian way. That is the difference. Uh, is Keynesian economics true or false? Is Marxian economics true or false? Wrong question from my point of view. The question is, which of them is the more profound foundation upon which the insights of the other can be incorporated? In other words, which framework uh, has the greater developmental power and the greater insight into the nature of the social reality, which is the underlying uh, thing that the economy uh, is, uh, expresses, is it, is it outward form of? So that's um, uh, my little 
uh, story. And that, that's my initial take on the relationship between uh, Keynesianism and Marxism. Marx, uh, what, whatever the details, you know, whether the rate of profit falls or rises or goes loop-de-loop, -loop, uh, you know, whether uh, a stabilization policy is effective or not, you know, you can go into all that. Uh, and uh, Marxist economists will have something to say on it, Keynesian, and post-Keynesian economists will have something to say about all that. The fundamental thing, the thing that goes right to the bottom of it, is the question of uh, what vision of the social system do you have in place when you begin to think about these economic categories. Uh, so I would really like to see that movie again. I, I don't remember how it ends, honestly. <laughs> but it's, uh, it, it's really, uh, uh, I, I, I thought it was quite riveting. Of course, you know what happens to you when you go back to a movie that you saw years ago and you thought was wonderful and you look at it now, you oh my God, you know, every, everything has changed. I mean, your point of view has shifted. Okay, how much time do I have? All right, uh, next point. There are three points in this talk, and I'm going to have to move around because I have to go over there. Okay. Um, you have nine minutes to be present. That's fine. Um, <laughs> about Keynes and Marx. And then finally, the last point, which may not have much time, uh, is about post-Keynesian. I want to say one thing about that. But here, first, let's do uh, something on Keynes and Marx. Uh, this is an old, simple exercise, but I find people don't know it. Uh, and it's not too difficult that you can't get it uh, you know, in, a, in, a, in a few minutes. I'm going to write the rate of profit, with apologies to Piketty. Here's the rate of profit. Profits, which I'm representing with a P, divided by capital, which I'm representing with a K. For those of you who are not economists, you probably wonder why do we use a K for capital instead of a C, and the answer probably is that C was used for cost and consumption and all sorts of other variables, uh, so they kind of settled on K for capital. Okay? Let me see if this one is any better. I would say it's because of Carl. Carl. Profit over Carl. <laughs> here we go. Now I'm going to perform one simple operation. I'm going to put the P here, I'm going to put the K there, and then I'm going to multiply and divide by Y. Y is the symbol for income or output. Income and output are the same for a, an abstract closed economy. We're not dealing here with international flows or anything like that. Okay? And what this tells us is that the profit rate is the product of two ratios. You can all see that these two sides are the same, right? The y's cancel out, p over k, p over k, all right? This is the inverse or the reciprocal of what Marx called the composition of capital, all right? It's not going to play that big a role in what I'm going to say today. p over y is the profit share. That is the measure of inequality that all the Piketty chatter is about now. You know, that is what uh, what uh, uh, we're concerned with, and all of the data, you know, massive data indicating across countries and for a number of decades now, uh, a rise in uh, uh, inequality. You know, the Piketty U curve, where, you know, inequality was high in the Gilded Era and then it dropped in the middle of the 20th century uh, for reasons which I think can be very well explained on Marxian foundations, and then it rose subsequently uh, into the neoliberal era. Okay? Now, if we draw a simple diagram where we put the profit rate up here and we put the profit share down here, the profit share for, for, for people who are familiar with traditional Marxist letter, uh, literature, you can think of it as S divided by V plus S. That's in, in Marx's value theoretic terms. That's you know, it's just many ways to, to think about this. This thing here, for whatever it is at a moment in time, y over k, uh, is a uh, array from the origin. It's just a, a line with a slope equal to y over k. All right, And it shows you a relationship between the rate of profit, which is like the index of the capacity of capital to expand itself. The capacity of, 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 of a capital is value creating surplus value in one of the pregnant definitions from the Marxist literature. So, so uh, that's the, uh, the rate of profit is also the foundation of the growth rate, uh, the basis for, for economic growth and, and limitations on the profit rate hinder growth. 
and hindering of growth can have various adverse effects on the economy. The profit share is an index of exploitation, the capacity of a capitalist economy to extract surplus from workers. Okay? Now, I postulate a sort of a, a minimum range for the profit rate. I'll just write min there. Uh, that is a range which can't be precisely determined, but it's a range where any crises associated with a falling rate of profit would become chronic. There, above here, there, the, uh, in this whole space above where my hand is now, the rate of profit is greater than this, right? If the rate of profit fell into that region, you would have chronic sustained crisis taking probably a highly financial form. That is, financial institutions would loom very large in the story of crisis that you tell at that level. Uh, now, <laughs> the profit share, uh, measure of the rate of exploitation, or in less uh, uh, Marxian language, simply the, uh, uh, well, the share of profits, the profit share, I think of any other way to say it. And that similarly has a range which is imprecisely specified, okay? And that's a maximum. <coughs> and if the profit share approaches this maximum level, less than one, of course, one is over here somewhere, all right? Uh, if a profit share approaches that level, I believe for the United States in the, in recent, uh, I, I did a, a little study just using two data points, one from the beginning of the neoliberal era, era 1980, and one for 2006, uh, that the profit share as meaningfully measured has actually crossed the 50% mark. Uh, but you have to do all the, all the corrections to, you know, the official data to get that, and that's all controversial. I'm not sure that's right. Anyway, what you can see is in an economy where the technology, the output to capital ratio, is the one given by this ray from the origin here, the economy maneuvers along this region here. It will be somewhere here based upon the balance of class forces in the economy. Uh, it might be here, for example. And uh, here is Marx's classic law of the, uh, 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 or one way to formulate the, the, the uh, Marx's classic crisis theory, if Y over K falls over time, but that is highly controversial, that's the rising organic composition of capital. Now we would need to go into, that could be a whole, a whole discussion. But if it falls, then the ray will rotate in this direction, and the region of maneuverability between the chronic crisis points, the barriers, becomes narrow. And of course, you reach some kind of an absolute crisis point here. Uh, Martin Bronfenbrenner, who did a diagram in the 1960s that I adapted into this one that I've used over time, calls this to sum and move, breakdown. But I uh, don't think breakdown is an appropriate way to think about it. Uh, anyway, I've usually used this diagram to talk about downward pressure on the rate of profit. If, if the actual economy is moving in some kind of a path like this, you see you have falling rate of profit, rising rate of exploitation. So you can have a falling profit rate and a rising profit share. And I actually believe that there's a, uh, uh, a model of capitalist growth, which gen I can't show it here, which generates exactly that movement. Falling profit rate, rising rate of exploitation, or rising profit share. Um, uh, Piketty, by the way, has no sense that the profit rate and the profit share are different things and can, can move in different directions. Uh, anyway, let's leave that to one side. And I'll finish with this now by saying, let's, for, for the moment, let's sidestep the controversy about the rising organic composition of capital, about this, you know, or what other ways of uh, introducing additional features into the economy you could use in this framework to account. Let us think about this point here, point A. We're at a moment in time. Sorry. One minute. Oh, we're down to two one minute. minute. Two minutes. Now we got it. We got it. Uh, Keynesianism says we need to avoid the realization crisis at all costs. We need to avoid the problems of effective demand that occur if we were to move in this direction. Right? If you were to do anything that raises the rate of profit, right, you would be causing the kind of demand side problems that are central to Keynesian thinking, including post-Keynesian thinking, okay? Neoliberal or supply side, or had Manchester School, you go back far enough, there's lots of different ways to describe this, says 
that the problem is if the rate of profit falls. We have to defend the rate of profit. Therefore, the neoliberals push in this direction. The Keynesians push in this direction. In other words, Keynesian policy, wage labor growth, uh, uh, government expenditure to stimulate demand and so forth, will have the effect of moving the economy to a lower profit share and therefore a lower profit rate. And those things will help with realization, with the realization aspect of the problem. But they intensify the problems on the other side. Okay? This goes back to my point about the movie, The Visit. And I'll end with this. Uh, what is happening here is that Keynesianism sees one contradiction the contradictions, the range of contradictions, the ones associated with a rising profit rate and a rising profit share along the single line here. They push in the northeast direction on this diagram, okay? They're oblivious, I got it backwards. The Keynesians push in this direction. They're oblivious to the problems associated with that, the financial problems, the low growth problems, uh, and so forth. The, other side, the neoliberals push in this direction. They argue for removing restrictions on the economy, removing financial uh, controls, uh, increasing profitability, uh, and they push this way. The Marxian position sees it whole. The Marxian position basically says to these two fundamental positions within mainstream thinking, within capitalist thinking, you're both right. But in fact, the problem is insolvable within the given system. So this way of thinking about it, instead of the usual way where we think of a political spectrum with Marxism here on the left, I'll go, I'll go from your point of view, here's the left, okay? And neoliberalism or free market ideology on the right, wrap it up, wrap it up. Uh, and, and liberalism or uh, interventionism, uh, Keynesian, post-Keynesian, whatever, in the center, this place is Marxism in the center. That is, Mar the Marxist view is the one that actually grasps both poles of this dilemma, uh, rather than sort of being on the surface and focusing on just one of the poles of the dilemma. Now, the next stage in this would be, if I were able to give it, to uh, explain why Keynesian demand stimulation, Keynesian anti-austerity policy, will not solve the crisis within a capitalist context, which doesn't mean that I don't support an anti-austeritarian movement anywhere in the world. You know, I'm with everyone who wants to move in that direction. But that brings us to the political question. And with that, I'll, I'll have to stop for now. Okay, I think we should open the floor now to the audience. Questions? Yeah. Uh, yeah, the, uh, there's, there's another crisis that's going on. It's the environmental crisis and, and global warming. And, and, and the discussion of the crisis in response to this, uh, even in, 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 in well, theoretically, and the points made, don't, don't, uh, uh, are, are dealing with uh, growth and, uh, uh, of the economy. Is, is there some limits to the exponential growth that, that, that need to be um, uh, Addressed and are not addressed by any of these frameworks. Uh, yeah, well, uh, I, I said briefly, you know, when, when I said something about uh, you know, the possibilities of growth in Latin America, that uh, China will continue to grow. And it's very likely that that will have a significant impact on, on the environment. Uh, there several issues, so I, I want to be brief so that I, I think you're right, there is a question of you know, how do you grow in a way that uh, it's compatible with still having a planet uh, at some point in the future. Um, however, uh, I think there are two issues that go with that that uh, are worth thinking. One is the question of how we distribute the cost of adjustment. So, uh, U.S. Uh, the advanced economies in Western Europe uh, do most of the, uh, they, they cause most of the global warming over the last 200 years that led to this crisis. And they still have you know, significantly higher levels of you know, uh, consumption per capita of energy. 
uh, to suggest the no growth for China in order to save the planet for you know, people in the West, I think it might be a, a you know, deal breaker. So it's very hard to say to the Chinese, don't grow at 7 8% a year. The other thing I think it's important to think about this, and I don't know the answer to your question, okay, yeah, but uh, there is no, you know, no society, you know, people say e-growth, we're going to have to have less people and grow less. And there is no history of it. Technological progress comes hand in hand with growth. Uh, there is no society collapsing in which we grow less in which there is dynamic <coughs> technical progress. So technical progress is both pro-cyclical, it's there in the data, so it, you know, in the booms productivity goes up and it decreases in the recessions, and it's uh, pro-structural. You know, uh, economies that grow fast is something called the, one of the few things in economics that has you know, not many things as you know, names of laws, the law of Caldo Gordon. You know, over time, countries that you know have higher productive labor productivity uh, are associated to countries that grow fast. And so, if we're going to generate the sort of technology that hopefully will allow for you know kinds of growth that are cleaner, and it passes through some sort of growth. Um, so I'm actually and so briefly saying something. I'm very much he he awaken all of my sort of you know King John stuff. I'm very much you know. Okay, I think that part of the story is that we needed a huge, you know, Green New Deal. So instead of spending lots of money, a huge amount of spending, uh, you know, if we can put, uh, you know, a bunch of scientists in, you know, some place in New Mexico and say, you know, you have, or whatever they were, you know, and you're going to build a bomb to blow up, you know, why can't we do this, you know, just put some people and, you know, and say we're going to have clean sort of technology. So. That sort of thing could generate employment. I don't necessarily solve all the problems of capitalism, uh, but it could sort of uh, move us in the right direction. So in this case, I think that there is something to be said about uh, sort of a big government Keynesian solution, or at least try it you know, for environment. It's probably not a solution. So uh, you know, I'm a pessimist at heart, so I think we're doomed. But you know, that's another story. <laughs> but I'll be gone. So my son, you know, he, he'll have trouble. He'll solve the problems. Uh, Okay, uh, any, anybody else here yeah, wants to say yeah. anything about environmental limits, growth? It might be a good idea to get, a, to get more group. questions and then, and then yeah, get uh, more time for people to go. Uh, I'm not an economist, so I'm going to try to... Uh, oh, you're, you're boasting ahead. now. Uh, a <laughs> question that I've had for some time now. Uh, I mean, this, in this country, we've had industrialization going on for quite uh, a long time. Uh, workers' skills have atrophied, plants have closed. Uh, manufacturing plants, uh, you know, processing plants. So, what happens when you do have like a stimulus? Let's say you, you do uh, uh, try to put money into the, the economy, uh, you know, prime the pump. Uh, how do you get a, a multiplier effect? You called it when there aren't really the factories that there were in the 1930s. In the 1930s, people were unemployed at the factories still existed there, the people still had the skills that they could, you know, bring to, to the manufacturing process. But when you have a, um, uh, an economy that, that is not based on manufacturing, but rather service economy, how would a Keynesian, um, uh, you know, pump uh, finding uh, process work? More questions? Yeah. yeah. Oh, any other? Question? Yeah, please. Really, at the heart of it, though, isn't Marxism just an under under uh, consumptionist, overproductionist theory, and to that extent, can wind up not necessarily adding a lot to modern economic thinking along post-Keynesian or MMT lines? Okay, pump priming and. Um, yeah, what, well, um, <clears throat> on uh, ecology and limits to growth, I'll say something very brief on, on each of these. I, I think if we were to sweep the capitalists off the planet tomorrow and just have us to talk about the problem, we could begin to address the very serious constraints associated with global warming, 
carbon emissions, population growth. You can approach it from many different angles, and we would have to have a principled, long-term developing political conversation uh, that could begin to move toward a solution, and I think this could be, could be accomplished. Uh, it would in be involved looking at growth in a very different way, you know. Uh, but I think that the qualitative aspect of growth, the increasing uh, capacity of human beings to uh, create and build an environment, a sustainable environment that meets human needs at higher and higher levels, uh, would continue to exist and could continue to exist. Um, but I can't prove that in any, in any simple way. Uh, what capitalism does is introduce this unprincipled element into the conversation because nothing can be done from their point of view that undermines their system of power and privilege uh, uh, and that destroys the whole thing. Um, on uh, stimulus in today's economy, in a service economy, in other words, I think the question is what would stimulus be in a service economy, in an economy which is heavily dependent on services? Um, I think there's a lot of mystification about services. Services involve massive amounts of material investment. Services rest on a material foundation. Uh, the internet is a vast network of server farms, you know, which are enormous capital installations, uh, which, by the way, consume a great deal of energy. Uh, and that investment uh, continues to exist um, in the United States. and. Uh, continues to serve as a foundation for what appear to be uh, intangibles. Uh, a service economy is not a weightless economy, as uh, Sam Bowles once played, play, played with the term. Uh, and there's plenty of job creation to be done uh, in the United States, uh, not least uh, repairing the crumbling infrastructure in this country, the roads, the bridges, the tunnels, uh, and, uh, and much else. Uh, and, and uh, dealing with environmental issues. So there could be uh, plenty of jobs uh, uh, if stimulus were applied. Uh, the point from a Marxist point of view, I think always, is that what we want to see or what we, more free time. Yeah, what, we want, what we want to focus on is the way in which stimulus affects social relations. Uh, when you try to have wage-led growth, for example, try to put money in the hands of workers so that they can purchase consumer goods and drive, drive the economy up. That's shifting the class balance of forces uh, in the direction of workers. I would like to see that happen. But from a capitalist point of view, it imposes very serious constraints. Uh, and uh, that will result in financial crisis and crisis emerging in other ways. So that it's never a question of, it's always a question of saying, we need to address that, but we need to address it in, in appropriate, uh, appropriately broader and more fundamental ways. Um, on, on, I, 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 no, I'm talking too much. I don't want to shut up. Uh, on on underconsumptionism, uh, again, I think the idea is that uh, if you deal with the problem of underconsumption, of insufficient effective demand, the way you deal with that both because of balance of class forces uh, um, aspects and, and, and some others, will put downward pressure on profit rates. And putting downward pressure on profit rates, uh, it's like a balloon, you know, squeezes, you squeeze in one place and it bulges out in the other. Uh, so that eventually uh, you have to look at the whole balloon and you have to look at the whole uh, social system. Uh, but that's not to say that one shouldn't attempt to address you know, uh, uh, immediate problems. Uh, as for modern monetary theory, I'll leave that to Julio. I'm, I'm not, not going to touch that one. I, I can touch that. Go ahead. But I don't know if David uh, wants David. to say stuff before. Uh, um, I talk to you. Uh, yeah. Um, this question about manufacturing actually brings up another um, important debate within Marxism. And it's the role of financialization, generally speaking, right? As we do more services or more financialization of things, is that productive or is that not productive? The sort of productive, unproductive debate. Um, and so the idea is that much that we're doing in financialization is unproductive and destructive, and let's go back to 
you know, manufacturing and this sort of thing. I think we have to be careful not to fetishize the form of capital as a particular thing, as a piece of machinery that has gears, those sorts of things. You know, what Marx was talking about with capital is that capital, using the term that Dave used, it, it's a social relation. So we need to think about how does financialization change the social relations. And in that sense, financialization may be or may not be, but it, it may be serving as a form of capital and producing value. Our, you know, <coughs> Marxists tend to, to really discount, they make a distinction between the real and the financial, this sort of financial stuff, but financial relations are changing dramatically. And perhaps there's some value that is being produced there. Perhaps there's some surplus value that is being produced there, right? And some, so I think we need to be, you know, we need to be careful of how we think about investment and how we think about capital. It's all about the social relations, not necessarily the nuts and bolts of the thing, the machinery. Um, the, the other thing we want to think about here, this issue of the underconsumptionism, aspect of this. How long have we gone through the debate, do we need more government intervention or less government intervention, right? So we go through periods where we need more government intervention, right, and then that doesn't work, and then we have less government intervention, and then that doesn't work, and then we go back to more government, right? So that pendulum tends to go back and forth, right? At some point, we've got to stop having that debate, right? Maybe it's not about more government intervention or less government intervention. Right? Maybe something else, which opens the door to some sort of Marxian ideas. It also opens the door to other things as well. It's not necessarily just a, an argument for, for Marxism. Right? But I think we need to be, we need to really, at least from a Marxist perspective, I think we need to challenge this, this, this idea of going back and forth with more or less um, government intervention. It's not exactly the same thing as underconsumption or not, but it sort of plays into that, to that argument. Uh, so before I actually talk about that, let me say something about, uh, I, you know, more or less the same line of what David said, but, you know, slightly different. First of all, even, even if we do by size living service economy, uh, at the end of the day, when you look really uh, at what type of society we live in globally, it's still very much a manufacturing society. Uh, in the sense that even if you think in the U.S., you know, even in the U.S., the size of the manufacturing sector has shrunk. By the way, the way it has shrunk, it's an important thing too. So the U.S. had up to, you know, uh, the 60s a growing, growing uh, manufacturing labor force. It stagnates more or less from the late 60s until um, the early 2000s. So it remains fixed, you know, more or less fluctuating at around slightly less than 20 million workers in manufacturing. So up to that as a percentage of the labor force? Twenty million, absolute numbers. Twenty million people, I'm talking numbers. And then after two thousand and two when China enters the WTO it collapses. So they have less than nine or whatever it is. So so the kinds of deindustrialization that you have up to two thousand is you know is that as a proportion it was diminishing before that. And since two thousand and two has shrank significantly. So those are different things. So there are different kinds of the industrialization. So the question is the proportion or in absolute size. So in absolute size is, and that, you know, I think it's uh, more relevant than just the multiplier effects because what he was telling you, and I think is right, that the multiplier effects are there. So, you know, in service economy and whatnot. So yes, you generate employment. There is lots of things being done. There is a material basis for the, you know, service economy. But the kinds of jobs you do matter because uh, this is a very Caldorian sort of thing, another unknown and, you know, deservedly unknown uh, Keynesian, in this case, economist. Uh, you know, one of the things that we do know is that productivity mostly comes from from manufacturing sector. So uh, you think of, you know, there's a famous story of Bamal disease. So uh, if you, if you, you know, hear the, you know, Berlin Philharmonic playing Beethoven's line, now how much better it is than it was, you know, in the 19th century. So how much does the productivity increase in services? And so, how much better is David teaching today than he was 20 years ago? Uh, well, so you see, so it's, uh, his productivity is going down. So the point is, uh, services uh, do have 
small changes in productivity. Even the things that we tend to say, oh, but medical services are much better. No, it's the equipment, the machinery that you know they use, the medications they use. It's industrial. So I think that what's important, it's not so much the multiplier effects, it's that um, the, um, you know, producing things is relevant because you don't learn to produce things better and be you know, more productive unless you're doing the things. It's learning by doing. And so that's the dangers, uh, the dangers of uh, the process of industrialization and, and whatnot that goes with that. Uh, mind you, the U.S. still dominates because of its, uh, the U.S. does industrial policy. So it's a very peculiar way of doing industrial policy, but the U.S. does a lot of industrial policy through its military programs. And so the U.S. still dominates the key you know, t tell me, I always ask myself, tell me what's the key fantastic innovation that comes from, you know, Chinese, you know, uh, you know, boom, you know, that we have had over the last 20, 30 years. And yeah, not there. It's, it's still American. So that says something. Um, so on, 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 you know, Marx and whether Marxism is under consumption. Uh, so so you're, you're pushing me all, you know, so he pushes me to, you know, want to be more Keynesian and you push me to, you know, sort of, you know, slightly more Marxist. So I think there is more to Marx than that. And, you know, so MMT, it's sort of a version of post-Keynesianism for those that may not. So it's modern monetary theory or whatever it's called, stated to some, some group of uh, post-Keynesian economies at the University of Kansas, uh, uh, Missouri, Kansas. And so, uh, what I, I would, would say, there are two, you know, sort of interesting stories about Marx and Keynes. So, so uh, Sraffa, you know, the economist I alluded before, uh, he had a fantastic line for uh, what John Robinson did. John Robinson loved Kalecki, you know, uh, David used Kalecki, and Kalecki basically coming from Marx reproduction systems came up with the same ideas as Keynes. And John Robinson used to say that, uh, Sraffa said that John Robinson used to treat uh, Marx as a, you know, uh, you know, little precursor, small, irrelevant precursor to Kalecki. So uh, that that there is a danger of you know what you said of doing something like that. So yeah, well, Marx had some sort of notion of effective demand, the realization crisis that I said, but you know, nothing more than that. Um, and so that's that's one thing that I think it's important. The the other things, Rafa gave Mark Keynes, uh, you know, capital for him to read one of those summers, and and Keynes actually said, in, you know, he I don't understand what you see in this stuff. You know, it's, and in the 30 volumes of Keynes' collected writings, there is one positive quote on Marx. You know, mostly he's uninformed, he doesn't know what he's talking, he didn't read it uh, and didn't like it. And so, and I said that correctly, he didn't read it and didn't like it. <laughs> and, but there's one positive quote, and the positive quote is exactly on when he's trying to explain in the, in the early versions of the general theory, something that he called at that point the monetary theory of production. And which basically he says is what essentially Marx calls capitalism and you know, in simplified form is, you know, money, commodities, money, accumulation. So that's the idea. It's that you're in an economy in which accumulation is central and an economy that it's just simple reproduction. And so uh, what I think, you know, uh, there is in that story. And, and that's also why I think uh, David might be unfair to some post Keynesians. I think post Keynesians can see other parts of the of the, the visit, and uh, not necessarily a narrow sort of view. So and that was probably a you know, neoclassical economist that learned something about the multiplier, but not much more than that. Um, uh, is this you know the sense that uh, to stimulate demand, it's not just simply wage led. You know, for example, if you look at the you know uh, who foresaw and said several relevant things about this crisis. Uh, we're basically, you know, post-Keynesian authors that said, look, we are having that because we haven't had wage growth. We have this significant expansion of financialization, and that led growth accumulated. So people have stagnant wages, but in order to keep up consumption levels, uh, they have, you know, been sort of forced to accumulate that and whatnot. So it suggests a wealth of issues that are not treated necessarily by MMT. I don't think it's incompatible necessarily. You know, issues associated to class conflict, to you know, uh, the, st the structure of production, so the sorts of things that we produce. So it's not the same thing to uh, be producing, you know, uh, airplanes or whatever it is, nanotechnology, and you know, you're producing, you know, whatever you're assembling. This is what they do in China. They just put it together, and so those issues that are broader than just you know, you pump money and you know and 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 the sort of narrow version, if you want, of Keynesianism uh, become relevant. Once you have this broader picture of 
uh, what the classical political economists thought and so on and so forth. So I think it's not only um, important, I would suggest that the point of Sraffa is actually that in order to get the Keynesian message right, you have to get rid of the neoclassical theory of value and you have to reincorporate the, the classical notions of uh, you know, value distribution. So I think that those, those are not necessary, you know, they're necessarily, if you want an alternative theoretical framework to understand the world, but those two things have to go hand in hand. Yes, please. Uh, hi, uh, I have two questions if that's okay. Sure. Be, Absolutely, we have uh, So my first question is to... Next time, lie. <laughs> Say, I have one question with two parts. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so I was wondering what uh, uh, Professor Leibman uh, thought about uh, uh, the other Professor David's argument uh, using your diagram here that, correct me if I get your argument wrong, uh, that uh, effectively there are no constraints on the, on the effective demand side uh, with a rising profit share because the capitalist consumption uh, can just uh, pick up the slack, so to speak. Okay. Um, so you don't basically face a, a double squeeze in your diagram. Uh, so that's my, my first question. My second question is about commodity prices in Latin America. And uh, I, I, I thought that you gave a lot of uh, uh, weight to demand, kind of demand side uh, explanations from China and such. And I was wondering if, uh, as, a, as a Serafian, you know, you also have a, a view that uh, perhaps world supply will increase as well and the, some sort of role for cost of production in the medium or long term, uh, and if that would impact uh, your prognosis for the Latin American development model. Uh, so, you want to go first, or you want me? Uh, I, I would just say that um, the point of my argument is not so much that this could go on forever, right. but rather that what neoliberalism has changed has changed the amount, you know, if you just look at the aggregate demand of that component, right? The, um, the interesting thing is, you know, when, when we were graduate students, we, we made the assumption that the uh, capitalists don't consume and workers don't save. Um, Kolecki, right? That's, that's his argument. But capitalists do spend, and workers, while they're not um, saving, they're dissaving, right? So when you say workers don't save, you don't get, right? You, you have to, no, they have debt, yeah. right? So you have to work that through. Um, so basically what has happened is that 19, the end of the 1960s, capitalist consumption of workers' debt was about 50% of profit realization. In 2014, it's about 67%. So I don't know where it might be in this sort of range, but that's sort of all I'm saying, that we're moving yeah. within that sort of, you know, band. Yeah, okay. First, I'd, I'd just like to clarify, um, I, I didn't really get a chance to talk about, post-Keynesian theory is very vast. You have to talk about Davidson and Minsky and, you, uh, and, and, and you know, the whole range of more recent, uh, the, the Levy Institute people and, and so forth. Um, I shouldn't have, I, I wouldn't like to be interpreted as dismissing the work that anyone is doing, um, and particularly a lot of the work that's being done by them. Uh, I think Tom Pally is particularly good. Uh, I, I think what happens often is that post-Keynesians or structural Keynesians, as Pally likes to call himself, uh, are looking for a way to be heterodox without embracing the totality, without embracing uh, a view of what Marxists call capitalism. You can apply some other word to it if you want to. Uh, and seeing it as a systemic whole. And that's what I think Marxism brings to the picture. Now, uh, essentially, uh, some of these people want to do Marxism without Marx. It's a, it's a political stance. It's like carving a space for being politically heterodox without uh, going over to uh, a formulation which is known to challenge the system uh, in its total uh, aspects. Uh, so uh, Tom, for example, and, and the, the strategy that's used here is to say, well, the Marxian position, that is, it all takes place in the labor market and that finance has nothing to do with it. Uh, whereas I'm introducing financial aspects of the social relations. Uh, and um, I just don't see why one needs to do that. You know, it seems to me that uh, there's plenty, not only in the classical literature of Marxism, but in its potentials, and the potentials of ways we can reformulate 
that enables us to bring those things in. Uh, then if it becomes a verbal dispute, you know, we're all doing the same kind of fundamental analysis which looks at crisis in its many-sided facets, which looks at the demand side as well as the uh, profit rate side, you know, and doesn't privilege one over the other, then we're doing good modern Marxism. If someone doesn't want to call it that, I'm fine with that. You can call it whatever you want to call it. You know, let's just... Uh, Pierre Garagnani once said to me very pointedly, and called, dragged, dragged me into his office to say this, you know, uh, it doesn't matter whether it's Marxist. It just matters whether it's good economics. You know, all right, I can, t I, I, uh, I, I can agree with that. Uh, only one other thing um, on uh, capitalist consumption. Um, can capitalist consumption pick up the slack and uh, that, that's left the gap uh, that's left in place by slag, uh, lagging investment and, and so forth and so on? Uh, and obviously, uh, in principle, it can. I think the answer is both yes and no. I think the MCM prime argument is a very important one. Uh, capital in its very nature seeks to accumulate the abstract power which accrues to ownership of capital. Uh, that's, that's what capitalism is about. Uh, it's not about uh, consumption. Uh, you can only have so many huge villas or jet planes or uh, you know, expensive toys. You, know, you can't find sources of demand in those areas which uh, replace the fundamental uh, driving force of accumulation. Uh, and it's that need for a fundamental driving force of, accumu force of accumulation under conditions where it's increasingly difficult for that to be forthcoming that creates the contradiction. Can it happen at all? Of course it can. But I like to think about displacing contradictions from one sphere to another. So for example, suppose in a particular country at a particular time, the problem of demand is solved not by increasing wages or by increasing uh, investment, but by increasing capitalist consumption. That displaces to another area where crisis can emerge, which I like to call legitimation crisis. And I think some of that is happening in the United States today. I think some of the buzz around Piketty's book, for example, is due to a very strong popular revulsion against the inequality which people associate precisely with images of high-level capitalist consumption. Then think that the managers of the mass entertainment media, who used to put on a program, The Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous, you know, are getting a little queasy about doing that because uh, under modern conditions, like the modern Gilded Era, uh, uh, it could provoke a political reaction, legitima a legitimation crisis of major uh, sorts. So if a country did manage to solve its demand problem by squeezing the balloon here and, and getting capitalist consumption to take up the slack, you'd have an enormously powerful potential for uh, using the visible unfairness of the distribution of, of, the distribution of consumption uh, as a way of uh, uh, attacking the system on those grounds. And that constitutes, from the standpoint of the system, crisis. Can I just say one? That what I'm talking about is profit realization, not total demand. Okay. So the issue that, you know, that, that capitalist consumption helps to Profit realization, yes. It doesn't solve Keynes's problem, which is one of ineffective demand and unemployment. Because clearly we have an unemployment problem, which that will not solve. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. If, if yeah. I can interject myself just here narrowly, uh, narrowly, uh, to add to what David uh, mentioned about the legitimation crisis, it's not only the, uh, the consumption by the capitalists, right? The, uh, the ads and, you know, uh, of that, but it's, it, there, there is this other possibility of what we call military Keynesianism, which is, uh, you know, the, the massive expenditures in war making, and uh, the, which has kind of another very dangerous, uh, you know, global uh, political aspect. So, uh, so that, 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 that that's another another uh, uh, possibility of. Uh, a kind of reactionary way of uh, conducting Keynesian policies or uh, expanding expenditures and therefore resolving the, uh, the effective demand uh, constraint, uh, but in a reactionary direction. Yeah. Very, very briefly, uh, the yeah. commodity sure. question. Yes. So, um, so no, well, actually what I was trying to do was diffuse the notion that it solved China. So what I, I suggested is that 
that uh, China has had an impact, but it's much less than what people tend to think. So it's, there are a few commodities in which they actually gush a lot of the commodities. It's mostly mineral commodities, and but not uh, not oil. Uh, so Venezuela, petropopulism, is nothing to do with China, and and certainly not the agricultural commodities. They don't have a significant impact. So demand cannot and has not affected that. Another thing that I think it's important. So talking about Strafian, there is a paper by Franklin Serrano. I think it's in the Strafa Center web page, exactly on this issue of commodity prices. And the notion is that there is a supply side explanation to for why prices, uh, commodities have been higher. And it's associated, uh, so if you look at the data on wages, so whereas they've been stagnant and not growing in most of the developed world over the last 30 years, they have grown fast in developing countries. So in China, wages are going up really fast from very low levels. And so, uh, cost of production are going up, and that filters into the prices of commodities itself. So there are supply side reasons. Also, there are speculative reasons, financialization. So there are you know, some humongous. I don't know what's the number now. The, the bro, you know, the Bank of International Settlements always have these reports. Last time I checked, it was something like 16 trillion dollars, I think. So the old U.S. GDP in derivatives of commodities. So there's a huge amount of speculation going on on that. And on, on that note, you know, some of the commodities, so Latin America is not particularly, most, most places in Latin America are not affected, or sort of South America affected by severe problems of uh, hunger and you know, nutrition issues. Uh, but speculation has had an impact on you know, food prices. Some of those are commodities, significant impact on, on, on you know, uh, well-being and nutrition levels, and particularly South Asia and other places. So uh, the fluctuation of these prices is not just a question of growth, it's a question of well-being and, and inequality and, and whatnot. So and I, you know, I was being narrow-minded and talking about Latin America. But no, point well taken. It's, it's certainly not just men and certainly not just China. OK, the gentleman back there. <clears throat> Session really, and, um, and and you, you talked about also um, financialization. Of course, has grown so hugely in the last thirty years or so. Um, we are all see, we're seeing the big corporations accumulating massive amounts of uh, of cash that they seemingly don't know where to invest. Uh, Apple City you know, alone is sitting on two hundred billion dollars or something. Um, one thing I haven't heard uh, is uh, the, the uh, issue of monopolization. Which, what, sorry? The issue of monopolization, which uh, a, a, a lot of people see as, as, as the other side of the financialization question. And I'd kind of like, like to hear uh, you all's uh, take on, on, um, on those two issues together. Uh, I think that that goes hand in hand in the sense that the financialization needs a pool of money, right? Where is it getting this pool of money? It's getting this pool of money from the corporate profits, right? So what, what a great deal, corporations can make all of this money and then lend it back to the workers who they're not paying enough in the first place, right? And so that's the idea that in some sense that what we need to discuss is the issue of the surplus, right? How, first on the production side, you know, how are we getting that, right? And part of that is this monopolization problem that uh, stagnationists are, are talking about. I think that's a very real, that's a very real um, um, process that helps to create the conditions, this excess surplus, which gives rise to the financialization, right? And everything that goes on with financialization. Right, so absolutely those two things go um, hand in hand, at least the way that I sort of understand how they go. Um, Matthias, anything? Uh, yeah, there was a study, uh, not, not long ago, I was trying to find it, not long ago, two years ago or so, there was this uh, study about corporations and they did some, you know, some fancy network analysis of 
know, how they're interconnected with this ownership of one corporation and you know, who owns what. And it turns out that, you know, it's, uh, the, the number is relatively small. You have like 50, you know, and they sort of coalesce. So once you get that this is under the sort of part of this group, they're like networks of corporations. Interlocking directors. Yeah, yeah, and there were like 15 of those that mostly controlled almost everything. They're mostly from U.S. and and Europe, so developed countries, corporations. So, but the way that's done, it's different. It's not as a technology from a technological point of view. There are all sorts of things happening. So sizes, this, that. But in, in terms of uh, financial control, that's that's one of the ways. And so, because there is more financial ownership of things, so uh, seems to be an increase in that. So. Just a slight follow-up question. In terms of your diagrams here, how did, to what extent does this relate? Does this rely on, on competitive uh, versus monopoly versus monopoly? Uh, <clears throat> well, I think the way to start the analysis is with, a com with competitive assumptions. And I think that uh, uh, capitalist firms, especially on a world scale, if you think about it, uh, uh, are still very largely dominated by the kind of uh, uh, atomistic competitive struggle that value theory in the Marxian sense depicts, you know. Um, but yes, uh, at some stage you have to then say, uh, what about transnationalization? What about the transnational corporations? What about these, uh, these, these interlocking networks of to what extent can strategic behavior replace, you know, atomistic, parametric behavior? You know, we usually respond to, to what's happening. Uh, to what extent can large agglomerations of capital behave strategically? Uh, and what effect does that have? Uh, and uh, I don't have a simple, I don't have a simple answer for that. I can't uh, say, well, it changes this specific aspect. Uh, I don't think it removes the overall conflict that basically private ownership of productive wealth entails, which is between uh, the need to uh, produce the surplus on the basis of which the system grows on the one hand and the need to realize it on the other. I, th I think, you know, that uh, that sort of tension between the two directions uh, would continue to exist, but it would play out in different forms. And uh, uh, I won't go into more details on that now, but uh, but 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 I think it's a, it's a very good question, important. And any other questions? Yeah. Well, what is to be done? <laughs> what is to be done? And back there, and I think we can close with that, and we'll have a little bit of time for. Can you raise your voice, please? Because we, we cannot hear you. It relates more to branding of the marketplace of ideas. Um, a lot of, I think, what's being important here obviously is looking at a problem on a scientific level. So we can solve you know, certain problems economically, but in the market exchange of ideas, I think you alluded to this, there is a branding. Um, I think that there are a lot of people who do believe that there's something systemic that's wrong right now with the entire system and are open to a dialogue about maybe an alternative system. I was wondering, when you're introducing your work, how do you compete with some of the mainstream distribution outlets to get it out of here? From a brand perspective, you, know, you can call it a, a Marxist theory something other than Marxism, but I mean, do you, when you're, when you're introducing I should say, you know, MMT, for example, is a, an attempt at branding. It's a, it's post-Keynesian theory. It's Warren Mosler's sort of idea. It's the baby, I guess. He's the one that branded it like that. And it's a, you know, it's sort of a brand, and it has sort of got some media attention. That's, uh, uh, but I think that MMT, modern monetary theory. So if you if you read it, it appears even in the New York Times, I think, or you know, certainly several outlets. Uh, which probably as post-Keynesian wouldn't. And, and so, you know, 
there is a question of brand, and I'm always, you know, I should say, sort of annoys me a little bit the question of whether we're going to go down to the question of, you know, we should hire a PR firm to deal with our, you know, or, I'm probably too old-fashioned, so it seems to me that, you know, uh, so that, you know, screw that, we should call it what it is, you know, it's, but uh, at any rate, uh, I think you're right that there is a question of uh, rebranding and, you know, and, and bringing, you know, sort of old ideas back to the fore of, you know, marketplace. Again, it's a terrible sort of analogy. I hate to call the intellectual discussion a marketplace. It's not really a marketplace. Uh, markets are, you know, not also necessarily branding. Yeah, but at any rate, I, I see your point. I understand that we do have a, a, a difficulty in getting our message, uh, particularly in a world in which corporations, which is what I think you said, corporations control, you know, media. I would say, from my perspective, my narrower perspective, I'm not in the media. They control, uh, you know, economic departments. How do you teach kids, you know, good economics if most programs that create economists create terrible economists which sometimes you cannot fix their heads anymore they're stupid forever you know it's very difficult and they control because they have donors that you know hire people University of Florida had they were hiring you know a whole department in economics and the uh, Koch brothers had a say on whether they would hire them or not it used to be that they gave you money but then you did whatever you wanted so you had a Marxist that had their you know whatever the Rockefeller chair in you know in world revolution that's not possible anymore because they apparently tell you what you can teach and not teach so it's even worse I, I'm concerned of what's the future of you know alternative thinking in economics which is important because it's scientific thinking in economics which I don't think it's you know most of the ideology that passes for economics, you know, it's not necessarily. So it, it is complicated. I don't know that we, you know, have a solution for that. And so, but you know, it goes in the same direction. So I don't. But again, in that respect, I don't think that branding is the solution. Uh, I don't think that you can brand yourself away from, you know, creating a paradox department. So it's a, it's a, it's a difficult thing to to defend those departments. But uh, I think that. Uh, you know, you have to defend it on the basis of what they are. Sorry. No, it's, it's crew branding and political marketing, but just remember that this panel was co-sponsored by the Journal <laughs> <laughs> of Science and Society, <laughs> scienceandsociety.com, and by the Union for Radical Political Economics, Europe.org. And the Koch yeah. brothers. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute, I didn't get any Koch brothers money. <laughs> Well, you guys are the Marxists. I'm the post Keynesian. I say that. Well, let, let, let me try to answer both questions here. The question is, what what do we do, right? What do we do? And we're talking a lot about them and the corporations and these sorts of things. And and the idea here is, you know, what what is exploitation, right? Exploitation is primarily the problem here, right? If we could decide what to do with this surplus we would probably distribute it differently, either the size of the, 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 size of the surplus or, and, or the distribution of that surplus would be different, right? Either we go back to wages or environmentally sustainable technologies or something or other free than, time. Or free time, exactly. Right? You're making your work a lot, man. You're thinking of free time all the time. <laughs> so the question is, so that's what exploitation is about, right? Somebody producing something which somebody else then appropriates and distributes as so the question here is the change that that one could think about is um, democratic um, or democratic workplaces, and so that where the workers who make this stuff can also decide where the surplus is going to go. And so if I work for Google, then we get together and we could say, hey, let's try to make the world a better place in this way or that way or this or wages or vacation time or what have you, right? And there are lots of examples of successful democratic workplaces, some in Silicon Valley, some in, in uh, of course, Mondragon, Spain, you write all sorts of examples like this. Now, you don't necessarily want to call it that, call it, you know, um, uh, you know the, the, the term of an entrepreneurial initiative could weigh that we could explain this sort of a thing, right? Democracy is important. Democracy is a very strong concept that people can and uh, that, that people resonate with that idea. And that's sort of, you know, what I think Marx was sort of talking about when he's talking about, you know,
sort of cooperative firms. It's democratic firms. And so I think that's a way to sort of understand what Marxism is trying to do from a, you know, the way to sort of present it and also provide a solution or at least some alternative to, you know, what, what's going on now. Well, on, on what is to be done, <laughs> a huge question. Um, the, uh, in terms of the general political uh, activity and the general political uh, struggle that we we undertake. I mean, what uh, it, it boils down to the question of should we be uh, addressing people's needs on uh, all of the levels at which those needs arise, and and, and working on every potential uh, what used to be called reform, but you know every every potential movement for improvement in in the conditions of working people in workplaces and communities uh, uh, on the one hand or should we be uh, envisioning a total transformation of the system on the other and the answer is yes the answer is both uh, and they should actually synergize with one another not be set as as uh, not be counterposed uh, on another level uh, more narrowly in terms of economics uh, what is to be done um, I did a book, I guess it came out two years ago, called Political Economy After Economics, um, Scientific Method and Radical Imagination for Routledge. Uh, unfortunately, the book costs $140 and I don't have any copies to give away. Uh, that's what Routledge does with its books. Um, sequesters them rather than publishing them. But the general point of that book uh, that I argue throughout a variety of chapters and applications uh, is that political economy, that I, uh, I suppose I mean Marxist political economy, but not with narrow boundaries, not with a, you know, this is the definition. Uh, uh, my definition of a Marxist actually is anyone who sincerely believes her or himself to be one. Uh, but, uh, uh, Just like race. Yeah, but political economy in the sense of, uh, uh, you know, uh, the study of the social relations of, uh, of capitalist society cannot be what it was in the 19th century or even in, in the 20th century following the, the, the economic term. That it has to incorporate good economics within it uh, and at the same time transform that economics. So, Possibly here again, my emphasis is a little, is a little bit different. Uh, I, I don't think those orthodox economists are all that stupid. Uh, I think sometimes their perspective is narrow. That's definitely true. Uh, but they are also the carriers of very important skills, which we need. Uh, in a sense, economics, including mathematical economics, is too important to be left to the bourgeois economists. That is, we need to bring on board, including things that they that have been developed in that framework. We have to need to bring them into uh, a critical uh, Marxist perspective. And if we're going to put forward theories of crisis, such as uh, certain falling rate of profit theories that have been around uh, in recent years, we better first of all get our arithmetic right, uh, and we better know uh, we, we we better have it on very sound theoretical foundations. So there's a lot of work to be done. Uh, both more broadly politically and more uh, narrowly in, in the sense of good, critical, radical economics. All of that needs to be done. With that, I think we close our shop here. Thank you.